heart disease is responsible for 28% of the deaths among women in America. That's a pretty startling statistic if you think about it because there are so many things within your control to prevent heart disease. And I'm going to share some great tips with you today to reduce your risk. Here's the cool part. When you reduce your risk for cardiovascular or heart disease, you're also reducing your risk for type two diabetes, dementia, and so many more health problems. I'm Dr. Morgan Nolte, founder of the Weight Loss for Health online course, community, and coaching program. As a geriatric physical therapist, I've seen the negative downstream effects of cardiovascular disease, and it's not pretty. I've made it my mission to help you get healthy to prevent those diseases I was treating in geriatric physical therapy in the first place. Each week, I bring you new content to help you lose weight, get healthy, and reduce your risk for disease. And if you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. I would greatly appreciate it and it helps this get seen by more people. Tip number one is to know the major risk factors for heart disease. Some of these are going to be modifiable, meaning you can change your lifestyle and lower your risk, but some are not modifiable. Let's start with the ones we can't change. Being male increases your risk for cardiovascular disease until women go through menopause. Then the risk level will even out. If you haven't already watched last week's video where I explain why women are at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease after menopause, definitely check that one out. It's loaded with good information. Other risk factors we can't control are older age, a family history of heart disease, and your race. African Americans, American Indians, and Mexican Americans are more likely to have heart disease than Caucasians. Now on to the things that we can control. I'm just gonna list them off here because I'm gonna dive deeper into action items that you can do later in this episode. Smoking, high oxidized LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, a sedentary lifestyle, abdominal obesity, diabetes, high C-reactive protein levels indicating inflammation in your body, high stress, poor nutrition, and excessive alcohol use. I also like looking at the criteria for metabolic syndrome. These criteria do differ a bit depending on which medical entity you're looking at, but if you have three or more of these criteria, you're considered to have metabolic syndrome and be at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. The first is abdominal obesity, and that's defined as a waistline that measures at least 35 inches for women or 40 inches for men. The second indicator of metabolic syndrome is high triglycerides or 150 milligrams per deciliter or higher. The next is reduced HDL cholesterol, less than 40 for men or less than 50 for women, increased blood pressure of 130 over 85 or higher, and elevated fasting blood sugar of greater than 100. Notice that LDL is not on this list for metabolic syndrome nor is it on the extended list of other risk factors for metabolic syndrome. The primary purpose of clinically diagnosed metabolic syndrome is to determine if someone has an increased risk for heart disease. With the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, AACE, the World Health Organization, WHO, and the National Cholesterol Education Program's Adult Treatment Panel 3, ATP3, all leaving off elevated LDL from this list, I believe major parties are beginning to recognize that perhaps we've oversimplified LDL and our energy is better focused on other risk factors to determine cardiovascular health. Oxidized LDL is a better predictor of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease than standard LDL cholesterol. The stronger association between oxidized LDL and cardiovascular disease suggests that a person's antioxidant status is a far more important determinant than standard LDL levels for the risk of developing plaques and the rupturing of those plaques that lead to heart attacks and or strokes. However, there was no association between oxidized LDL and total LDL concentrations. In other words, you can have high LDL and high oxidized LDL with an increased risk of heart disease, or you can have high LDL and low oxidized LDL with a reduced risk for heart disease. If you currently have high LDL or are taking a statin, I'd really encourage that you watch this interview that I did with cardiologist Dr. Nadir Ali. 
It's extremely valuable, especially if you're living a low carb lifestyle and everything else is going in the right direction except your LDL. This interview will explain why. Dr. Ali also recommends looking into a coronary calcium scan if you're concerned about your risk for heart disease. This is a CT scan that tells you how much calcified plaque is in your heart's arteries and a much better indicator of your risk for cardiovascular disease than your standard LDL. If you don't know your numbers, now is the time. Turning a blind eye to your own numbers doesn't do you any good. And the sooner you confront where you really are with your health, the sooner you can start to take more ownership over it and make some healthy changes today. It is never too late to change in the right direction and no change is too small. Now let's get into some actionable tips that you can use to lower your risk for heart disease. I think it's helpful to consider things from what I call the four pillars of health. The first pillar is diet or nutrition. The second pillar is movement or exercise. The third pillar is stress and the fourth pillar is sleep. Let's start with the first pillar, diet. This includes not only what you eat, but also when you eat. If you're in perimenopause or have already gone through menopause, what and when you eat become crucial components for a healthy lifestyle. As estrogen goes down, insulin goes up. So if we aren't proactive to keep insulin low, we develop more insulin resistance. Insulin is your body's fat storage hormone and the primary determinant of your body set weight. If you want to learn more about which specific foods I recommend to keep insulin low, go ahead and download my ultimate food guide and you can find that at weightlossforhealth.com forward slash ultimate food guide. If you come from a calories or points background, like most of my members do, this information may be a little new to you and that is okay. Feel free to re-listen or re-watch this video again. Now, not all food affects insulin the same. Take a look at this graph. There are three main types of carbohydrates, starch, sugar, and fiber. Refined starch and sugar cause the biggest blood sugar response and insulin directly follows blood sugar to help it get into the cells for energy or storage. Protein has a moderate insulin response and fat has almost none. If you wanna lower your insulin, eat less sugar and carbs, especially refined sugar and carbs. A diet high in bread, pasta, candy, soda, cookies, cake, all that good stuff will keep your insulin up and further it will cause roller coasters with your blood sugar and dopamine in your brain. I like to say that sugar begets sugar. The more you have, the more you're gonna want. Also, starch and sugar don't trigger our satiety hormones like fats and proteins do, making them very easy to overeat. That's why we always have room for dessert even after a really big meal. Fiber is another kind of carbohydrate, but it's heart healthy. Women should aim for at least 25 grams of fiber per day and men for about 35. Now insulin is important, but if we were only to focus on that, we'd be missing another important aspect of how our food choices can increase or decrease our risk for heart disease, and that's inflammation. From this graph, one could assume that all fats are okay because they have a lower insulin response, but not all fats have a low inflammation response and inflammation will lead to insulin resistance. I go into more detail about healthy, neutral, and unhealthy fats in this video, so be sure to check that one out next. And also, again, download that ultimate food guide for more specific food examples. Earlier, I mentioned something called oxidative LDL. This is associated with increased plaque buildup. A couple ways we can use nutrition to reduce oxidation of LDL and oxidative stress in general is to eat an antioxidant rich diet, including dark chocolate in moderation, of course, um, fruits, especially low glycemic fruits like berries, um, like blackberries, raspberries, and strawberries in particular, and non-starchy vegetables. Get plenty of omega-3 fatty acids from things like salmon and reduce omega-6 fatty acids from processed vegetable oils like soybean oil or canola oil and things that are fried in them. I recommend using olive oil, avocado oil, butter, or coconut oil for cooking instead. So there's some advice on what to eat. Regarding when to eat, I'm a big, big proponent of intermittent fasting and recommend everyone fast for at least 12 hours, preferably 14 hours a day. Intermittent fasting for at least 16 hours stimulates something called autophagy or cellular cleaning. 
Autophagy is powerful for disease fighting and just reducing aging of our cells. It can help reduce inflammation and insulin resistance. Now I could talk about the benefits of intermittent fasting forever and I've kind of covered it in several other YouTube videos and interviews that I'll link to below this one. Moving on to the next pillar of health and that's movement. We live in an increasingly sedentary environment, especially with many of us working virtually from our computers, we need to be more mindful about how to incorporate regular movement throughout the day. Getting up every hour for a little bit of movement, walking or stretching is really good for your health. Moving right after a meal is also beneficial to balancing those blood sugars and bringing insulin lower. Different forms of exercise have different benefits. We tend to think about aerobic exercise as being the best for heart health. After all, that's why we call it cardio. However, strength training is more important than cardio for healthy aging. And when performed correctly, strength training can double as cardio with an elevated heart rate. So you're killing two birds with one stone. If you want resources for strength training workouts, let me know in the comments and I can hook you up with those. If stress is an issue for you, you may want to incorporate more activities like walking and yoga into your routine because these specific forms of physical activity help reduce your stress. Speaking of, let's move on to the third pillar of stress. Acute stress is not a big deal for your heart. It comes and it goes. Way back in the day, our major stressors were, were to fight or flee from animals. When we're stressed, the body prepares itself by ensuring that enough sugar is readily available to fight or flee from that stressor. Our bodies are well designed for short bursts of cortisol, especially when it's a physical stressor and we can put that extra energy to use right away. But now our stressors look very different and don't require a level of physical exertion. So our blood sugars still go up, but we're just sitting there and not moving our bodies and using that extra glucose. And as a result, insulin levels will go up. So does our body set weight because insulin has to push that sugar into the cells. Stress can also negatively impact our sex hormone levels and downregulate our metabolism, further contributing to weight gain. The last pillar of health is sleep. Getting good sleep can be a big problem for women in perimenopause and beyond who have more anxiety, night sweats, depression, and just hormonal changes that make good sleep harder to come by. I talk about sleep a lot because it's an overlooked area for weight loss. If you are sleep deprived, there are a myriad of hormonal shifts that make losing weight all but impossible, including, but not limited to, elevated insulin, increased ghrelin or hunger hormone, reduced leptin or satiety hormone, and reduced human growth hormone that leads to a decline in muscle mass and metabolism. A couple more notable lifestyle changes you can make to reduce your risk for heart disease is to stop smoking. Smoking greatly increases your inflammation and oxidative stress, contributing to a higher risk for heart disease. Lastly, limit your alcohol intake. When it comes to alcohol, long-term heavy drinking and binge drinking appear to be the most detrimental forms of alcohol use. Having one or two drinks on occasion is fine. Just remember that if you're looking to lose weight, alcohol is technically empty calories and serving sizes do add up quickly. Alcohol also has been shown to reduce digestive enzymes, making nutrients harder for your gut to absorb. Alcohol also has an inflammatory effect on your gut and can affect intestinal permeability, causing toxins that should be safely housed and moved through your body and out to leak into the bloodstream. So there you have it. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you learned how to reduce your risk for heart disease. Be sure to share it with someone who needs to hear this advice. And if you found any value in this video, please take a moment and subscribe to the channel and turn the bell on to get notified each week when I post a new one. Leave a comment below and say hi. All of that engagement helps YouTube share this video with more people. Thanks in advance for helping me spread the word and I'll see you soon in the next one.